Hi, we're going to talk about using an app to receive biofeedback information uh, to talk about uh, trauma and the impact of trauma on individuals. And to talk about this, I'm really glad to have with us Dr. Tanya Jovanovic. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences and the David and Patricia Barron Endowed Chair in PTSD Neurobiology at Wayne State University. She is the director of the Detroit Trauma Project, which investigates the impact of urban trauma exposure on the brain. Her research employs uh, physio, um, psycho, psychophysiological and brain imaging methods to examine biomarkers of risk for trauma-related psychopathology, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in adults and children. Uh, Dr. Jovanovic has received multiple grants from the National Institutes of Health and two awards from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. In addition, she, re she serves on the board of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, the abbreviation is ADAA, and is on the Scientific Advisory Board for Dynamore, a large European project investigating resilience factors. She has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers and served on national and international grant review panels. So Dr. Jovanovic, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah. And in terms of all of your publications, uh, uh, that's how I got to know you. Um, so I saw your article on the associations between children's trauma-related, um, uh, what's that word? Sequelae? Sequelae, yeah. <laughs> oh, sequelae. So and the consequences, the health consequences. The, ah, yeah. there you go. And skin uh, conductance captured through mobile technology. So it has to do with using this uh, new mobile app um, to get the, uh, the biofeedback information, uh, doing this remote monitoring um, to talk about the impact of trauma. Uh, so I was wondering if you can share with us a, a little bit about that, about the app and what it does. Uh, that, would be, that, that's, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so um, the way it works is that it measures how much your hands might be sweating. And usually that's related to maybe how stressed you feel at the moment. And usually the more stressed we are, the more we sweat. And so that's really our brain talking to our sweat glands and we start releasing sweat and we can measure that with electrodes on the hand. And so this particular app, you just strap these Velcro straps on your fingers, and then you plug it into like the audio jack of either a tablet or an iPhone, any sort of smart device, and you get the app downloaded. And then you can see th that trace of how your body is responding to whatever is happening. So, you know, if you started to do a really challenging math problem, you might see your skin conductance go up, you know, and this is just, again, whatever is most distressing to you, you will see it, your body respond to that. And it's a nice way to kind of visualize what your body is doing, because sometimes we don't connect very well to what we feel or think to how our body is reacting to those things. And so it is a nice way to objectively measure that without some of the you know, subjective biases that might come from answering questions or from how we want to interpret how we feel about different things. Um, so the way that we have used it is to measure um, the level of distress someone might feel when they talk about uh, something bad that happened to them, like a traumatic event. And the reason why it's important to measure this is that the degree to which you might respond with distress when talking about trauma might be predictive of then how symptomatic you might be in the aftermath of that trauma. So we initially used it, um, as I'd mentioned, 
in the emergency department to see if we can predict who might develop post-traumatic stress disorder six months later. And most people are resilient, and this is true of adults, children, everybody. Humans are tremendously resilient, and that's always the good news. The bad news is that between you know, 10 and 15% of the people will actually have pretty bad outcomes from a traumatic event. And what we would like to do is know pretty early on who that might be, because then those are the people who need the most attention. And the earlier we might be able to intervene with, you know, either therapy or get people into social support groups or things like that, we could actually prevent those symptoms from even emerging. And again, that's both at the individual level and at a public health level, a really important factor. And so we initially used it with adults and we found that it was very predictive. And then we wanted to really know if it works in children because we also want to know children who have experienced traumatic events, who is going to go on to maybe be at risk for developing depression, anxiety, PTSD later. Again, those are the children that we want to pay a special attention to then. So we've been doing this study now in Detroit for a few years. And Detroit, um, as many people know, yeah, can be a really dangerous place to live. For a lot of our children um, growing up in this city, they have a lot of exposure to neighborhood violence. And so there's a lot of you know, hearing gunshots, seeing people fighting. Um, and especially in our population in Detroit, it's largely Black American, and we see a lot of exposure to discrimination, to racism, a lot of also domestic violence and assault. So we really wanted to see how the children are affected by these things that they see in here. And so our first study, we uh, recruited children from Detroit and they are nine years old when they start our study. And the idea is that we're gonna follow them across time and we're gonna look at how their brain and body changes in response to these experiences. And so the, the first study is this one at nine years old. We already have a lot of our kids experiencing pretty severe trauma. So on average, by the time they're nine, they've had five major bad things happen to them in their life. Um, and there is some range there, but we have very few kids that have not experienced anything. But we did find that when we uh, talk to them about the trauma, if we have them attached to this app and we get this skin conductance response, then the degree to which they show an increase in responding when they talk about the trauma is related to how, how many symptoms they have of PTSD. And, and so that's really important because we think that something about how their you know, autonomic nervous system is working in response to talking about trauma is telling us something about their vulnerability, their body's vulnerability to this event. And that that will over time manifest with more symptoms and even more problems. Um, so that's this paper that you had mentioned was really in these Detroit children. Um, yeah, and so the, you're, you've been doing these studies for about three years, right? In Detroit, so, yeah. In Detroit, so I could see where you can, you know, you, you have that length of time so you can say, you know, if someone has a traumatic experience, and the app is picking up, you know, these measurements, um, then you can predict with some accuracy what it's what they're going to look like in terms of symptoms six months later. Is that right? Well, that was in the emergency department with adults. So with the children, you know, we this is a longitudinal study. Of course, we had to shut down for COVID for about a year and a half. And so we're now bringing the kids back for a follow-up appointment. So what we will be able to do is see, because all the data in this paper were collected prior to the pandemic. So we can now see a year and a half later if it's predicting anything as we bring them back. 
All right. We're yeah, just that's... now in the process of bringing them back. Yeah, that that's very helpful. Um, so you'll you'll be able to see about a year and a half later, and and those results you don't have yet, right? No, that's still ongoing data collection. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the emergency room work, you do have those results, and and what is the what is the predictability level uh, for the six months? You know, out. Yeah, so that's a really good question because there are a lot of different things that you know play a lot into of factors. This. Yeah, really a lot of factors, and these are risk factors that we know. If someone has had childhood trauma, they're at higher risk of developing PTSD. If they have an adult trauma on top of that, um, women are more likely to have PTSD after trauma. Uh, there are a number of factors. The more severe or serious the traumatic event was, the more likely they are. So what we did with the emergency study is that we controlled for all of the factors that we kind of knew beforehand were going to be risk factors, childhood trauma, sex, age, um, things like trauma severity. And even after all of that, the skin conductance response was still a very strong predictor. So the way I think about it is childhood trauma is a big predictor of PTSD. Some of that is, we don't know why that is. Why is it that something that happened 20 years ago, how is it that the body remembers that this happened? And maybe one of the ways that it remembers is the way that our body then reacts to future stressors. So it might be part of how we're measuring the skin conductance response that's actually capturing some of the changes due to the childhood trauma. So it's kind of saying that this is part of the body's way of dealing with that trauma that then increases risk for future symptoms. And so that's the, the nice thing about the way we measured it. And it was, if people had, you know, we kind of had a marker of First, we would get two minutes of recording without people talking about trauma, and then they would start talking about the trauma. And the change from that baseline to the response, if it was more than two and a half microsiemens is in the recording, and that's on, on the app, it shows you the microsiemens, and it shows you the change. Um, and then uh, they were you know, at greater than 90% risk of having PTSD. So it was a pretty wow. strong predictor. That is very significant. Yeah. And that's, uh, and when you say, in, you know, 90% likely to, to develop PTSD six months later. And, and how is the PTSD uh, diagnosed six months later? So that was in this emergency department study, we would have them come back every, uh, they came back at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. And then when they came in, they would do an interview for PTSD symptoms, for depression symptoms, you know, other things that were happening in their life. So this was based on uh, that interview six months later. Yeah. Wow. That's very significant. Um, so you know, a lot of behavioral health professionals uh, have been using the SUDS, mm -hmm. right? The SUDS scale uh, where you, you know, you ask the client on, on the SUDS scale, you know, say zero to 10, how much distress are they experiencing? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be very interested to see how this measures up with that subjective scale. Has any of that been done? So I have a... Um colleague who's been doing this with uh, veterans at the Emory Veterans Health Center, and they do prolonged exposure therapy with veterans, and they've been doing SUDS and this eSense app. Um, and I also am really curious to know what they're finding. So because they're doing it clinically, they haven't been using that data to actually do any analyses. And so I don't know, I need to check in more recently with, um, you know, after the pandemic and part of it was that they stopped seeing people in person. So I don't know really what the results of that are, are. but I'm, you know, now that you're saying 
talking about this, I really want to, this is reminding me to follow up with that, because I think there would be a really strong correlation. There may be times when people are under endorsing how distressed they feel, but they might actually show a bigger response. We also think that sometimes we think people kind of, well, especially when talking about trauma, tend to kind of get a bit detached from it and not want to feel that distress, but then we still see the skin conductance response. So those are the times when it may not match up. But I think for the most part, we would expect that they would match up pretty nicely. Yeah, and in terms of the skin conductance, uh, so the assumption is that's correlated with anxiety or distress, um, but can it also be correlated with excitement or, you know, positive things that you would want? So that's one thing. Another thing is, uh, so the body's having this reaction, but how well does that correlate with how someone's uh, emotionally experiencing that because I wonder if some people are able to have the physiological uh, symptoms, but in terms of their thoughts and emotions uh, may or may not be as impacted. Right, so, um, so first, your first question, whether there are positive things that could increase skin conductance, and that's definitely true. Yeah, so um, they tend to be things that are more on the exciting sort of positive than calming, happy, positive. So I'll give you an example. I had a, a high school student who was working with me. This was back at Emory and she was working on a high school thesis and she wanted to use this app. She wanted to work at Grady, but she wasn't 18. And so she couldn't actually go into the hospital with our staff to interview participants. So she had come up with a questionnaire that she was going to ask her fellow students. And she was asking them about, you know, again, high school students, she was asking them about what girls or boys they liked in the class. And so she had them, she had, had the app on her phone, she had the electrodes on, and she would ask them these questions about how they felt about other people in the class. And I remember she sent me uh, one of the files with the skin conductance. And she said, I think this guy likes me. And I said, Oh, I think he does. Because <laughs> you know, that, uh, yeah. definitely see a, a big response. <laughs> so right, right, she right. Was talking to him. So that was a pretty fun application of, of that. But yeah, so there are many things because the, the skin conductance itself doesn't really uh, determine good from bad. It's just saying you're, you're feeling again, more of a physiological response and it could be something positive. Yes. Um, and then whether or not the physio physiology is reacting, even if someone maybe emotionally isn't impacted, um, that could be the case. I'm, you know, it would be interesting to see what the healthier thing is. You know, is it that someone maybe is more, you know, in denial about how they're feeling rather than not truly not being impacted by it? Is it someone who's actually avoiding thinking about it? You know, avoidance is a really big problem for trauma victims because it, that is the thing that keeps people out of therapy. They don't yeah. want to talk about the thing that happened and they don't want to think about it. And they feel like if they go see a therapist, they're going to be forced to think about it or talk. Yeah. About so it. maybe part of the it, using this in therapy, I wonder if a therapist would look at the congruency or incongruency mm -hmm. between what the app's picking up and what the person's reporting. Right. Yeah. One of the things that we've done with some of our, this wasn't with the app, but it was with our bigger psychophys setup. Um, we found that the more um, people respond to, to, so what we did, this was in a veteran population. So we had a virtual reality scenario of Iraq and Afghanistan. And these were um, you know, service members who had recently returned. 
And when they would watch this VR, we had them also measuring skin conductance, heart rate, other kinds of measures. And, and then they would go into prolonged exposure therapy. And we found that if they responded more before going into therapy, the therapy worked better. So it is actually the, the more physiologically responsive they are, the more engaged they are in the therapy itself, the more they engage they are with those, like the visual cues. And it is maybe that they are less avoidant. And so they're, a, you know, they're going to participate in the therapy a lot more because as you know, patient engagement is so important. Um, and they could even be in a therapist's office and still be avoid, avoiding thinking about it and just kind of be disconnecting from it all. Uh, so we do know that the, the body is telling us when someone is connecting to that material or stimulus, whatever. Um, and that is actually a predictor of success in treatment, especially for prolonged exposure or imaginal um, you know, exposure where people have to think a lot about or talk about the traumatic event. Yeah, now in terms of evidence-based treatment, I would really like to do a study using this app on all the different uh, therapy styles uh, mm -hmm. for addressing anxiety, stress, PTSD. Because they all claim, right, that, that theirs is the uh, the best out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, there's there's all sorts, and I, I don't need to name name them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it'd be great to. This is a very objective way mm -hmm. of looking at the effectiveness of treatment. Yeah. So this is um, fantastic, and it could be uh, built into EHRs, patient portals. You know the. Mm -hmm. The, the client, the clinicians, they can all see the direct result of mm -hmm. therapy, interventions, behavioral changes, et cetera. Uh, this is phenomenal. Now, when you, you said you worked with uh, you know, children, adults, older adults, um, I've heard that older adults uh, on average tend to have much better resilience mm -hmm. uh, for traumatic events. Uh, has this been used to identify, and I know this is kind of new, so this is you know research mm -hmm. that probably will be done in terms of what are those factors uh, that help with resilience? Mm -hmm. and, and is there a difference between age and location, uh, economic level, you know, you name it, those kind of factors? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. Um, there is a, yes, older adults are, tend to be more resilient and Partly it's because I think they've experienced a lot more and seen how they've been able to overcome a lot of the challenges in their life. Yeah. And so Can I pause I you there with that? Because, <laughs> yeah, the idea is that they've had a, a bunch of experiences and they learned what works for them, what, what doesn't. That mm -hmm. might, be, might be what mm -hmm. it is. But related to that, I wanted to say that in your studies, it's, it, it shows that when people have had really traumatic experiences, um, and they've had more than one traumatic experiences, it actually reduces uh, their resilience. Um, so, uh, you know, some people say, oh, I'll make it, make you stronger. It'll toughen you up if you get some traumatic experiences. Uh, yeah, maybe not. So maybe it's that, like I know with exposure therapy, um, with exposure therapy, you only expose the client to things that you believe they're going to be successful at. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it has to do with you experience difficult things and you've learned how to be successful at those things. Mm -hmm. Maybe that develops more resilience. Whereas if you experience traumatic things that you were not able to be successful at, maybe mm -hmm. it will make you less resilient in the future. I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? In terms of yeah, I mean, definitely we know that there's, um, you know, sometimes we think of it as a dose response in that if you think of the traumatic events as increasing the dose, that you're much more likely to have PTSD so, and, and have worse symptoms. And as I mentioned, if you have childhood trauma and then adult trauma on top of that, and then again, you're much more likely to have PTSD. That said, I think that we, 
we do see that trauma kind of increases, but then throughout the lifetime, it might decrease a little bit as you get into older age. So there might be not really a linear relationship with resilience, but, you know, somewhere, you know, maybe as you get over 50, you start to become more resilient, you know, whereas up until that point, you might have had this with increasing trauma, I'm more and more symptomatic. Uh, and there are, are a lot of, you know, both racial and economic factors that play into this as well. Um, we did, interestingly, actually, we just looked at this in Detroit. I have one of my um, research assistants is a uh, getting a master's in public health, and she was really interested in uh, neighborhood disadvantage. And so you can use uh, census tract data from where people live to determine this area deprivation index. And it measures things like, you know, um, how many vacant homes are in the neighborhood? What's the neighborhood crime rates? It, it calculates this index of deprivation. Like, are there grocery stores? How many liquor stores? Things like that. It's the 17 different factors that go into this. But if you look at people who are in the, uh, so what we looked at was depression across this ADI, uh, deprivation index. And if you look at it by race, it's the white people who are much more impacted by ADI. So if you, um, the idea was that there's actually more resilience to neighborhood disadvantage in black communities in the sense that even at low and high disadvantage, they had you know, equivalent rates of depression. But if you look at non-Black individuals, we saw this like that their depression was very dependent on the neighborhood that they lived in. And so if they were living in a pretty well-off neighborhood, they had pretty low rates of depression. As soon as the neighborhood disadvantage increased, their depression rates went really high. So much more uh, just susceptibility or you know, to, to that neighborhood. And, and so we thought of this as, and in fact, we found not just that they had lower rates of depression, but just higher rates of resilience, things like uh, optimism, social support factors that uh, play into just being more resilient. Uh, so that was really interesting because we kind of expected to see the opposite. We thought that we would see greater vulnerability um, in our, you know, the, our Black participants versus our non-Black participants because we, you know, in Detroit especially, uh -huh. they're much more vulnerable. But we actually found much more resilience in the face of neighborhood disadvantage. So. Uh huh. Yeah, interesting. There are actually lower rates of depression. Yeah, and um, and was the was this app used for that, or this? No, this, this was all like because uh, this was data that we collected during the pandemic. So we were, you know, doing interviews remotely, um, mm -hmm. and yeah. just using their address census data. I see. Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, we we haven't been able to, or we haven't done it yet, although there's a possibility that the app could be used remotely because it's so easy to put on. And we have a video uh -huh. to show people how they could do it themselves, uh, put it on, and then they can just email the Excel file that it generates. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Can I share the uh, web page for the app? Yep. Um, so this is a, an image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just couple of things that you put on your finger there, plug into the, the uh, tablet or smartphone with the app and yeah. you get your reading. Um, so I'm curious in terms of there, there's been a lot of uh, biofeedback devices throughout time. And, you know, some of you have all electrodes on the, on the head and you get all these things, right? Um, so how does, how does this compare to the, the different, uh, uh, data data markers that you might get from other um, uh, biofeedback devices? Well, I, I think this one I like just because it's 
very simple and not all physiological signals are the same. And you know, sometimes you might have, <clears throat> you know, we were talking about this, some physiological responses are very quick. So uh, if you were to do an EKG for heart rate and you wanted to look at variability of heart rate, you need to be, uh, you know, collecting heart rate data like a thousand times a second. Whereas for skin conductance, because it actually takes a while for those sweat glands to start activating, and by a while, I mean three seconds as opposed to milliseconds, because it takes three seconds, then we can use a pretty low sampling rate and we can collect data 10 times in a second as opposed to a thousand times in a second, and we still will get an accurate reading. And because of that, these then the files that it creates are very small. And then the other thing that I like about skin conductance is it's so easy for people to visualize. And you can, you know, you don't have to have a degree in anything to just see that that line is going up. You know, you can kind of see it and it moves slowly. With heart rate changes, it's actually hard to tell because you're just seeing, you know, that what. What, what, and it might be spaced a little bit further apart or not, but it's really hard to tell unless you really know how to interpret an EKG what's happening. And it requires, you know, quite a bit of data processing before you have your answer. But skin conductance really has these very nice visual changes and that are pretty dramatic and, again, obvious to anyone who's looking. And I find it most useful really in a clinical context where you could have a therapist and a patient looking at it together so that you can kind of see what's happening, but then also interpret it together rather than just, I think, traditional biofeedback, you would kind of just on your own try to regulate, you know, like okay, I'm going to try to slow my breathing so that, you know, my, you know, skin conductance might come down and you might be able to do that. Um, but I don't know how therapeutic that is if you're just kind of doing it on your own. So I think it's better to do it in a context with a therapist where you're kind of looking at it together and interpreting that data together. And you're kind of talking through, this is what your body's doing. This is how you're, you know, you're saying you're subjective units of distress are. So let's, you know, look at these and say, what are we getting from these two pieces of information about how this is impacting you? Yeah, and then we can see when we look at this the next time we meet, does it look different? Does it look better? Uh, you know, are we getting better here? You know, I, I think there's so much that can be done. I think the other thing that's important about using physiological markers especially with mental health, is that there's such a stigma to mental health. You know, there's like still to this day, you know, something's wrong. I'm just crazy. But if you can see that it's really your body that's responding, it's then no different than, you know, having pneumonia or something that again is out of your control because it's just how your body is reacting to outside stimuli. So I think it does help patients to see, you know, yeah, this isn't, it's not in my head, you know, this is my body that's to also reacting to this. So, you know, it kind of, I think gets around some of the stigma. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have some more questions about this, if you don't mind, because <laughs> um, I see some challenges. Um, one is like when you when you do it. So when you put the electrodes on your fingers, seems like it would drastically change the results. Uh, so I could see like one of the challenges would be if it was like a watch that you're always wearing or something that was just you know stuck on you that was always that you're always wearing, where it's using uh, Bluetooth, uh, where it's just constantly connecting and constantly getting the data, and then using artificial intelligence. Uh, to, to summarize the data, you know, from, from a week's time and be able to tell you like, okay, I was doing this at that point. I was doing that at this point. 
and being able to identify, you know, what, what's triggering, what's, what's helping, you know, uh, activate the, uh, say the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so yeah, if you could speak to that, like, it seems like it really depends upon, um, when, when you put it on and are they looking at maybe advancing, uh, how this, how this device is being used? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you had it as a watch and it was on there 24 uh, seven, potentially it would be useful because you would maybe forget that it's collecting data. And so you would influence maybe, you know, intentionally or unintentionally the data a little bit less. Um, the tricky part about that is that if you are on the back end, you're looking at these data and there's a lot of times in a day when, you know, maybe your skin conductance goes up because maybe it was just a warm day. Maybe you're like, again, it's your sweat gland activity. So anything could make it go up. And if you didn't tell, you know, the system, the watch, you know, so my, my thing is that you would want to have a marker that you could either speak or record what is happening now. Like I'm feeling distressed. I need to let the data mark the data so that on the back end I can be like, oh yeah, that's that this happened then. And it either needs to be time locked to either a diary or something, because you have to have the context in which it's to interpret it. If you don't have any information about what's going on, then it's it's really hard to interpret. Uh, I was part of the study that had a watch for when watch data, and it generates mountains and mountains of data that have to be like, as you said, like either using machine learning or artificial intelligence, it takes a long time to process. Um, some of the data, you know, if you get a bad connection with the watch and watch is not the best for getting skin conductance because you don't sweat that much around your wrist as you might on your hands. Um, so we do have that and we had thought we would pair it with the GPS on the watch. And the idea was that if we could see if people are getting distressed, if they're going home or leaving home or going to work, you know, they, they, we would pair it with some of that information. And, um, and I think that's the goal, but because it's so data intensive and heavy, it takes so long before you actually get to those results. And then there also, with the GPS, sometimes people who are really symptomatic just don't go anywhere. You know, like if, if they're very depressed, they may not ever leave home. And so that doesn't provide you then that context. Um, so I think the biggest challenge um, with this just ambulatory wearable type devices is providing the context to understand what's happening in the moment. So the, with the eSense, you're creating the context. You, you're doing your baseline measurement and then you're talking about trauma or you're doing a therapy session or something. You are creating that context. And so of course we would expect to see a response then more so than just driving somewhere or talking to someone. Um, but then we have that data marked and it's also limited to maybe, you know, all of maybe from two minutes to maybe an hour and it's not these massive loads of data. Yeah. So a therapist might use this app in different ways. So the, the clients in the office, you might take a baseline when they first come into the office uh, and then you take a reading when you're talking about things that could be triggering to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're able to see where are they now compared to, you know, three weeks ago, right. uh, or they might have, uh, things that are stressful for them in life. Mm -hmm. Um, when they're like you mentioned at work or they're taking a test in school or something mm -hmm. like that. So they can take measurements at those times and see how it's changed over the course of therapy. Um, is, is that how a therapist would use this? Yeah, I think so. I think those would be some of the more promising ways. So, I yeah. see. And, and this looks very similar to like the lie detector test uh, that they would use. It, it's kind of based on a lot of the same um, 
physiology and ideas, except that I think the lie detector is a very um, kind of old school, you know, still maybe have had a lot of the subjective readings, you know, if you think about that needle, like going up and down. So yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it does have some of the very similar foundational ideas. Yeah. And the price of the device is like about $150. Is that right? And then the app is free. Is that how that works? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much for your time. This has been really helpful. We would love to have you back. Uh, we can talk forever. Uh, I want to be, <laughs> want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. Um, I said, you need to head to the airport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, You're very talk welcome. Talk to you soon.